This week, I felt like doing something easy that doesn't tax my brain. It's Friday. Uh, and of course, I realized that um, sometimes we go into a lot of depth with some of these topics, but not all of you anatomy students will need that depth or we won't be starting at that level. So we really should go back to basics sometimes. So I thought we could talk about the lungs. Right? You probably know all about the lungs. In which case, you can watch this video. Uh -huh. I know that. I knew that. And I knew that too, which is nice. Always a nice feeling, that isn't it? But if you don't know about the lungs, then we're just going to talk about the, you know, the lobes, the fissures, where you would find the lobes, uh, the shape of the lung, the surfaces, how high it goes, how low it goes, some of the other structures nearby it, the mediastine, and that sort of thing. All right. Like most organs, the lungs have lobes. And the idea is that of a lobe is kind of a separate part of an organ and you can probably remove that separate part and not affect the other parts of the organ. So that lobe has its own blood supply and nerve supply kind of going in and then it branches and branches and branches, something like that. Uh, in fact, the lungs have lobes and they also have bronchopulmonary segments, which um, is another way of describing that pattern. So you could remove a bronchopulmonary segment and not affect the other bronchopulmonary segments. Might be useful in a patient with a lung cancer, for example. And that's what we see on this model here. See all the colours there? Those are the different bronchopulmonary segments. There are about 10 in each lung. Unless you're uh, going into surgery, I wouldn't bother learning the names of them or anything like that. Just be aware that they exist. And um, we usually say that the left lung, remember we're always talking about patient's left and patient's right. The left lung has two lobes and the right lung has three lobes. And we always say the left lung's got two lobes because it's smaller, because the heart projects over to the left side so it fills more space. But really, you could, you could still get three lobes in there, they'd just be smaller, wouldn't they? When we look at the embryology, we get the two main bronchi, uh, you know, the primordial ones, they form, and then we see on the right three branches and two branches form on the left. So it's all programmed. Um, so why are there two lobes on the left? I don't know. Is it, I mean, the space is a little bit smaller, but we might have to delve into our evolutionary past to find out why there are two lungs, two lobes. Of course, lobes are quite useful because if you have separate blood vessels going in and out of each lobe and uh, separate airways, theoretically, if you were to get a blood clot um, clogging the pulmonary artery going into one lobe, the other lobe or lobes would still function, the other lung would. In fact, um, a pulmonary embolism is incredibly dangerous and does kill people suddenly. So it's not a perfect system, but theoretically that could work and people do survive of a pulmonary embolus, a pulmonary embolism. And I guess if you just had like one blood vessel, we well, do have one blood vessel going in, but it branches. If you, anyway, lobes, lobe theory. Right, so if we look at the left lung, we have two lobes. We have a superior lobe and an inferior lobe. Often get called the upper lobe and the lower lobe. Feel free to refer to them like that if you want to. And can you see how they're split by this, this fissure here? This is the oblique fissure because it's running obliquely across here. On the right side then, we have our upper lobe and our lower lobe, but we also have a middle lobe very sensibly named. This is the end of the oblique fissure there. Let's have a look at the fissures again in a moment. But this here, we have this extra fissure here, this uh, horizontal fissure. Now, when we're looking at cadavers, this horizontal fissure is very rarely, or it's never as beautifully defined as what we see on the model here. Sometimes it's a little short fissure. Sometimes we hardly ever see it. It's a little indentation. And sometimes it's a much longer and much deeper fissure. The middle lobe is there, it's just not always obvious from the surface of the lung that there's a fissure in the middle lobe. So if you just have a lung on a tray, that might happen to you in an anatomy exam, but I don't know where else it would happen to you. If you were trying to decide whether that's a left lung or a right lung, it's, it, you know, it's not the best method to say, oh, it's got two lobes because so it, it's a left, so, that, so it must be a left lung. Sometimes you just, you'll just miss that horizontal fissure and you'll think there's two lobes and it'll be a right lung. The best thing to do is to look at the shape of the lung and determine which is the, the apex, which is up here at the top, 
where the base is, which is down here by the diaphragm, which is the costal surface, which is the rounded bit round here by the ribs, and which is the, the mediastinal surface, which is next to the mediastinum or mediastinum, if you prefer, in the middle. So we'll look at the shape of the lung, right? And we'll look at those shapes. But while we're in situ, as it were, notice that the apex of the lung is actually going really high. It goes up above the level of the first rib. So an injury up here in the shoulder could cause a lung injury because the lung goes all the way up here. And notice how the liver, so we talk about the, the heart taking up a lot of space on the left side, but look at the liver. The liver is taking up a lot of space on the right side and it's pushing up underneath the right lung. And uh, limits how much, you know, you can expand. Uh, the lungs normally fill their part of the thorax. They fill as much space as they can, which is why they, we see this coming around here. And when we look inside the cadaver, we find that this anterior edge of the lung is very, very thin because it's filling as much of the space between the heart and the thoracic cage as it can. And what, what we often see is we see this, this cardiac notch here curving around. This is the, the left ventricle of the heart posterior to it. But we, it often gives this lingula. This lingula is a tongue-like projection of this lobe of the left lung, and it kind of pushes over the inferior part of the heart here, filling that space. So lingula is something you might come across. Right. Okay, so what have we got here then? Let's take off the thoracic cage. Oh, look, we can see the lingula again here. We can see that cardiac notch. Um, let me take this out. Oh, look, see? So... Look, there's the first rib there. These are the scalene muscles attaching to it, and on this side too. So if I take off this, look how high, look how high the apex of each lung goes, right? So it's going up above the first rib there. Now, one thing to notice is that this is the upper lobe, this is the lower lobe. Now, there's that oblique fissure curving around here. So it, it is running very, very obliquely. But if we consider the left lobe in the first instance, if you're, you want to listen to your patient's chest um, and you want to listen to the upper lobe and you want to listen to the lower lobe to make sure everything's good, to listen to the upper lobe, well, that's easy. You just listen to the, the anterior chest. And pretty much all of this anterior chest then is uh, you have the, the upper lobe deep to it. But to listen to the lower lobe, you can't just go down low into the chest and try and listen to the lower lobe, because it's not there. Look, this is still upper lobe. If we spin this around. So to listen to the, the lower lobe, you have to listen laterally or posteriorly and fairly low down, because look, up here, the upper lobe is posterior too. If I pop these apart a bit, you can see that, you can see that oblique fissure. Now the lungs are covered with visceral pleura and the thoracic cage is lined with parietal pleura. And I've done a couple of videos on the thoracic cage and the movements of breathing and that sort of thing. So I might have talked about the pleura there, but essentially the pleura is one continuous membrane, a bit like the peritoneum is, and the visceral pleura is the pleura covering the lung. We just call it visceral pleura because it's covering viscera. And if you were to look inside the oblique fissure, you'd find that visceral pleura going into that, um, covering the lung surface through that oblique fissure into the hilum of the lung and back out again around here. So it's a continuous airtight covering of the lung here. Um, if we look at the other side then, if I just lift this up a little bit. What? Uh, here's that middle, here's the upper lobe, here's the horizontal fissure here, and here's the middle lobe. And we tend to say that the, the horizontal fissure is around the level of the nipple, which in the adult male chest, the level of the nipple is about the fourth intercostal space. And then inferior to that, we see anteriorly, we see the middle lobe. And again, you have to spin around and really get posterior, or lateral and posterior and inferior, to find that lower lobe. So bear that in mind if you're examining a patient and you want to listen to their chest, you want to listen to each of the lobes. Um, imagine this, but with skin on and ribs and stuff, right? All right, so 
let's take this one out because this one's going to be way more likely to fall about and way more challenging. Um, but look at this, this is the shape of the lung that I was talking about here. So you can see it's got a pointy apex. So you can always find the apex of the lung because it's the pointy bit. And look, the, the diaphragm is domed. And in this case, it's covering the liver very much on the right side. And when we breathe, that dome gets flattened, increasing the volume within the thorax so we breathe in. So when you're looking at a lung, that, that dome surface there, that's gonna be the base, the diaphragmatic surface. That's the apex there. Now, much of the rest of this, and you'll, if, you, if you look at cadavers and fixed lungs, you'll see impressions left by the ribs. So this gets called the costal surface. Ribs, right? And then if we turn around and look medially, we see a couple of things. We see the root or the hilum of the lung. Uh, and this is where those two layers, so the, the parietal pleura, which is lining the thoracic cage here, um, will meet the visceral pleura and run out around the lungs there. So in the root of the lung, we find pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins, and they're large blood vessels because the, the purpose of the lung is to do something with the blood, and that is to take the carbon dioxide out of it and to put oxygen back into it. So a huge amount of blood goes into the lung. We have this massively branching tree of blood vessels within it, and it's the same for the air. So the, the airway that goes in as it enters, um, it branches, 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 and we have this massively detailed and complicated tree. Now the pulmonary artery is an artery because it's going away from the heart, but it's coloured blue around here. This is the superior vena cava, but, but this blue vessel here, these are, or well, this is uh, the pulmonary, the right pulmonary artery here, and it's, it's coloured blue because it's carrying poorly oxygenated blood into the lungs. Within the lungs, then we have gaseous exchange occurring, and the haemoglobin becomes well oxygenated, so it changes its Fe state and becomes bright red, right? So we have these bright red blood vessels coming out of the lungs, and those are the pulmonary veins, and they're veins because they're leaving the organ and going back to the heart. So the colouring is reversed of what we'd normally expect, right? But it's called an artery because it's going away from the heart, and it's called a vein because then it's going back to the heart after leaving um, an organ or a tissue. So we've got the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins, um, and then we've got the airways here. Now, the heart and the great vessels are within the mediastinum or mediastinum. Mm, you'll probably hear both pronunciations. Um, and if the lungs are surrounded by pleura and kept within their own connective tissue space within the thorax, then the lungs and the great vessels are also kept within their, they're, they're covered in connective tissues, and they're kept within their own connective tissue space, which is the mediastinum. And this is where the mediastinum meets the pleura here. So those connective tissues meet and blend. And you can see this cut line here on the model. Um, so this is then also called the mediastinal, media, mediastinal surface of the lung on this medial side here. And we see the same on the other sides. So we have this mediastinal surface, the apex of the lung, the base of the lung, and the costal surface laterally. Now one clever trick is trying to work out what the structures are at the hilum of the lung. And it depends a little bit on what you see on how far away from the heart the hilum has been cut. Because we've got, this is the left lung, apex, anterior, base, posterior, right? So this is a, a left lung. Um, when everything enters the lung, it's gonna branch straight away into two lobar branches to go to the upper lobe and the lower lobe. So the main bronchus will split into two lobar bronchi and the pulmonary artery will split into two lobar branches, right? Um, so if you cut further in, you'll see more branches, more cut edges. And if you cut further in, you'll see far more. And if you cut in, you'll see far, far more. So this is a little bit variable, but a little bit of a, you know, a bit of a thinking exercise that I, I think is useful is to, on the plastic model, it's easy to work out what's what because it's beautifully colored. But what I'd like you to do is to imagine the heart next to it. So think about the heart. This is the heart, it's oversized, so it's way too big, but you want to think about how the heart plums into the lungs. So you're, you know, 
if you're studying human anatomy or you're studying uh, an allied health subject, then your knowledge of the structure of the heart should be awesome. So you should remember that the pulmonary trunk leaves the right side of the heart, it leaves the right ventricle and goes up, runs superiorly, there's the pulmonary trunk there, and then it splits into left and right pulmonary arteries to go into either lung. So that means that the pulmonary arteries are superior. You should remember that blood returns from the lungs to the left side of the heart, so to the left atrium, which is inferior, right? So you should remember that the pulmonary veins are inferior and return to the left atrium, right? So we've got pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins. Now, if you add the, the airway onto this, the trachea is posterior to all of these structures, right? You can see that if I take the thymus off, you can see how you have the blood vessels anteriorly um, and uh, the airway then is deep to the blood vessels or posterior to the blood vessels. So the trachea is here and then it splits into the two main bronchi. That means that the bronchus is going to be kind of posterior to these guys, kind of middling-ish, that sort of thing. So then we pick up our lung, and we've got our hilum, we can see that these are branches of the pulmonary artery superiorly, these are branches of the pulmonary vein inferiorly, and this is, this is anterior, this is posterior, so kind of in the middle and posteriorly, this is the left main bronchus here. Um, and this is what a lot of anatomy is, isn't it? It's three-dimensional structures and you storing that, those three-dimensional structures in your head and remembering how they all link together and sit together. That's the challenge. Okay, so um, that's it really. The lungs are incredibly important. They are somewhat fragile. Um, and if we want to talk about the pleura in detail, we'll do that another time. Otherwise, this video will be three times as long or at least twice as long. But we've looked at the, the right lung and the left lung, we've looked at the different lobes, we've looked at the fissures, we've looked at the surfaces, um, we've looked at the shape, we've considered the liver pushing up into the right lung, and we've considered the heart pushing out into the left lung. We've considered them going up into the neck and what have you. And if you want to read or uh, see more about the movements of respiration, you can go and look at the ribs video or the uh, breathing while cycling video and see how you get on with that. All right, uh, it's quite nice doing straightforward stuff, although I still feel like there's something I've missed. Have I missed anything? I mean, I've missed a lot of detail, but I don't think I've missed anything crucial. Let me know. All right, see you next week.